throughout the period of Kali Yuga, which is the age of lesser spiritual understanding, which is really what our planet has just been passing through and is now coming out of, throughout um, the culture of India, which Master describes essentially as the spiritual elder brother of all other countries on the planet, the teachings of Sanatana Dharma, of the, of the essence of all religion, have been kept alive primarily through the force of, of the two epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The Bhagavad Gita from which we quote is an extract from the Mahabharata. The Ramayana is the story of Lord Rama and his beloved wife Sita. And it's a simple, very um, deeply moving love story between Rama and Sita. So much so that Rama and Sita in the Indian tradition are the essence of a divine, perfect, perfect uh, human romance. Krishna has his partner, Radha, but they were only together when Krishna was young, and then Krishna left and Radha had to love him in solitude ever after. Rama and Sita were a king and a queen. However, early on in their life together, Sita was abducted by the evil demon, demon Ravana, and the entire story of the Ramayana is how Rama bravely with his brother Lakshman and other uh, helpers, divine helpers, goes to battle and wins back Sita. Now during this long period of time, Sita is in the hands of the demon. And when she is finally recovered by Rama and brought back to the kingdom of Ayodhya, lesser minds begin to whisper, was she always virtuous during the time that she was away? Was she tempted and did she give in, you know, to live in a way that would not be worthy of a queen? So there are several different endings to the Ramayana. One of them is that Rama decides that he'll put Sita to the test and a fire is built and, if, and Sita has to walk into the fire and if she's unscathed, then it proves her purity and otherwise, well, that's how the story would end. Other endings of the story have that Rama banishes Sita and he lives without her, even though he never doubts her for the good of the kingdom because the doubt has arisen. He feels that we cannot have this uh, lack of trust and lack of faith. Now, one can't help but think, after all they've been through, for heaven's sakes, can't they have just a little happiness at the end of the story? And I recall when I was preparing to tell these epics as I have done on several occasions just with the all the spiritual symbolism and for the sheer joy of what I call effortless philosophy to be able to learn these deep truths by just hearing these marvelous tales of men and women and gods and goddesses I said Swamiji why does it have to end so sadly he said well it wouldn't be true to life if they just lived happily ever after would it you know, that's what's known as we have words for that. It's called a fairy tale. Remember? <laughs> like that? Because life itself, as we experience it, is a, a st series of ups and downs, isn't it? We're, we're totally captured by this uh, power of human romance, whether it comes to us in the form of a the, the perfect life partner that we have always dreamed of, whether by the grace of God we give birth to some perfect infant who instantly steals our hearts and holds us for the rest of our natural lives in an utterly self-sacrificing sense of devotion. Uh, you know, it's, it's so dear. Swami Kriyananda said uh, his mother was not sentimental. Uh, so when Mother's Day came one year, he sent her a card and um, there was this picture of a, a real tough sort of longshoreman guy. It was just a sketch, you know, big biceps and tattoos and really strong and a really scruffy face. And he's dressed in a little sailor suit, like a little boy. And it says, Happy, uh, Happy Mother's Day, Mommy, from your little boy. <laughs> and you know, it is always like that, isn't it? There's this tender heartedness that we develop. And whether it's, you know, uh, you see an elderly couple who still 
You know, we, uh, uh, an outsider might see a woman who might be wrinkled and gray-haired and faded as women can be over the course of years. Fate is, time is not kind to feminine beauty. And you know, and then in the eyes of the man who spent his life with her, he looks at her and what he still sees is that great beauty. And the mother looks at her huge strapping son and she still remembers him so adorable in his little diapers and when she used to hold him in her arms. You know, it's, life is a very tender, a very, very tender-hearted experience. And at the same time, it really isn't a happily ever after, is it? Just one thing after another happens to erode the simplicity, either by tragedy or by the sheer uh, drops of water on a stone that gradually just wear down that superstitious expectation that we'll have everything we want and nothing will ever take it away from us just because we want it, isn't it so? Now, in the Western spiritual tradition, well, actually both in the Jewish and in the uh, Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition is totally just filled with efforts to destroy the Jewish people. There's a, the, a joke that Jews tell to each other, and I, being Jewish, can tell it. The essence of all Jewish ceremonies is, uh, holidays is, they tried to kill us, they failed, let's eat. <laughs> And they're always trying to kill the Jewish people, and they always fail, you know? And then there is this um, strong affirmation of let's just go on with things then, okay? Now, Christianity, of course, is this extraordinary tale of triumph and tragedy, you know, just alternating triumph and tragedy. And Palm Sunday, and it's, it's exemplified, of course, by this a cycle of Easter, which begins appropriately with Palm Sunday. And it's a very important part of understanding the story of Easter and the entire story of the life of Jesus to realize that it really begins on this day. And that's why the traditional celebration has us come together first on Palm Sunday. And then we go through this week, um, which in, because uh, Jesus was, a, a, it was the Jewish tradition, it was actually the Passover week and the Last Supper was really the Passover Seder. All the traditions come together. And then, of course, Jesus is, after the Last Supper, he's arrested, he's humiliated and tortured, he's crucified, and then, of course, he's resurrected. But what happens on Palm Sunday is an important part of that story, partly because it also really draws all the people in. What was going on in the story is that Jesus, by the power of his magnetism, and of course, by the divine mission that had been given to him by God, he had been, over the three years of his ministry, ever increasingly e expressing, allowing more and more of the power that was in him to come out. Now, these masters uh, follow a pattern that's divinely inspired often, and oftentimes there's a pattern. In Jesus' case, he removed himself from the scene of his, mis uh, of his mission. He, he left um, the, the people he had come to serve and actually went off to India, the lost years of Jesus. So from 13 to 30, you don't know where he is, but he was in fact preparing himself for the mission. So his actual mission took place during these few years. But often masters essentially hold their light in until it's time uh, for that work that they've been doing, which has only been vibrational, to actually come out in a, in a specific form. Jesus did the whole cycle in a short time. I know in the life of Ramakrishna, who was a great master in the 1800s in India, there was a period of time, he was an avatar, he was born free, but it wasn't until the end of his life that his, his public mission really became um, known. And there was a point at which the light that was in him um, began to cause his skin to glow. And he, he was visibly filled with light, but it wasn't time for people to come. And Ramakrishna was very peculiar. And a great deal about his life is it's known because there, there was a man who wrote down everything that happened 
uh, just uh, M, just wrote it down when he was there. So there's all these details. Ramakrishna went up onto the roof of the place where he was staying and he, he starts going like this and he says, go back, go back, go back inside like this. You know, it's not time, go back, go back. And he just, he just uh, covered the light up again. So in the early years of Jesus' mission, ministry there, when he was gathering disciples, he, 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 I, I have to figure out, what I'm trying to say is, you see, it can't be too overt, because if it's too overt, those who are his destined disciples do not have to do the inner work required for them to perceive the truth. You see, if God just writes, it and, it writes you a chit and says, here is a God-realized master, and you just follow him and everything will work out. And we just sort of pick it up, you know, like coupons at Walmarts. And we all have one. And then we all just dutifully go over and redeem them with the guru. It, it won't work because inwardly we haven't refined our own nature sufficient where our own perception is clear. I mean, the masters are free. They, they, the light, the sunlight shines right through them. The problem is that we're not able to perceive it. Uh, there was a very feisty disciple of Yogananda's named Swami Turiyananda. He since passed away, and he was in charge of SRF's Lake Shrine in Southern California. He's a very marvelous man. And somebody was speaking to him once and said, you know, I really don't think I can follow Yogananda's path because I feel I need a living guru, you know, somebody who's there, who's going to tell me what to do. This Yogananda passed away too many years ago. And so he said, I'm, I am going to go find myself a, a living guru. And Turiyananda, with puzzlement and, and just instantaneous wit, said, Yogananda's alive. It's you who are dead. <laughs> you know, meaning that power is there. It's just a question of being able to receive it. So Jesus appeared in, uh, in Jerusalem and in the midst of the culture in which he, the people he had come to serve, the people of Israel he had come to serve, and he just began to teach. And there were many different rabbis. That it's a very, uh, the, the religious life at that time was a hearty give and take with lots of people's interpretations and little uh, rabbis here and there who had their groups of followers and various different interpretations of things, all carefully governed by the Pharisees, who was a very powerful priesthood who was in charge of the, the religion and the religious life of the people. But within that, there were many different rabbis who spoke and who gathered their followings and were approved or disapproved. And Jesus was one of them. And he was, of course, very charismatic, very powerful, and quite original in what he was saying. He was not orthodox. And the Bible is full of all the controversies he had with the Pharisees and the other approved factions about what was and was not acceptable. And he would always stand firm with his interpretations, but he would fight only up to a point. He would antagonize them only up to a point. And gradually, individuals in the, in the community there would hear about him and go to hear him and be very impressed by what he was saying. And more deeply, those who had the capacity to receive would re receive not only the words he was saying, but also this unique vibration that was coming from him that would in some in, uh, unknown and unfathomable way begin to transform their own inner reality. Because when a master comes, yes, he brings often a new uh, interpretation of the ancient teachings, a new expression, Yogananda called it. Not a new religion, because there is no new reality in infinity, but just putting it together in a way that resonates exactly with the time and the place and the culture and the people he's there to serve. So, of course, Jesus could just walk by the shore, as it tells other, other places in the Bible, and his destined disciples would see him. And it's so beautifully said, and he says simply, follow me. And it tells how the disciples dropped everything to follow him. Now, imagine for a moment, because these were people just like us, imagine for a moment what kind of communication must have taken place for an individual to hear two words like that, to drop everything, and then for the rest of his life to be committed to that reality. This was the power that Jesus had for those who would receive it. So here he is, 
over the course of these three years. And he's very systematically traveling all through the area and speaking in many different places. And then gradually he allows the power that's in him to begin to come out in astonishing ways. Those who are blind are able to see. Those who are ill are able to be cured. There's the story of the one woman who just touched the hem of his garment. And a, an illness that had plagued her for over a decade just goes away like that. And the story is also told how Jesus in that moment sensed, as he put it, power has gone out of me. Who touched me? He said. Because he could feel that there had been a deep and profound contact between him and one of those many who were crowding around him because his own sensitivity was so profound. Now in the meantime also, because Jesus knows what his destiny is. The Orthodox uh, Pharisees who have the power over all these people begin to see that Jesus is posing an increasing threat to their orthodoxy because he was there to break the narrowness of their religious tradition. And he's challenging them and he's answering them boldly and forcefully and, and too well in front of the public. And so there's this beginning factionalization happening among these people. And then, of course, there's the story, which happens just relatively soon before this, this last week of his life, where Lazarus dies, is buried in the tomb, is three days in the tomb. And Jesus, who is a friend of the family, who had been at a distance, who delays his return, he's told that Lazarus is sick. And he does not come back immediately. Time passes, Lazarus dies. So by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been in the tomb for three days. And the sister of Lazarus falls at Jesus' feet, weeping over the grief of the death of her brother. Oh Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. Because she has such faith in his healing power. And Jesus didn't come. He could have come, but he didn't. And Jesus said this, happened not that Lazarus would die, but that the power of God would be demonstrated. And then there's the story, which is such a glorious story, where he suggests that the rock that covers the cave where he's buried, the tomb, be moved aside. And one of them says, he's been in there three days, Lord. By now he stinketh. It's so practical. You know, I, I love little moments like that because partly they're given to just remind us this was a very real situation. You know, his body had been in the tomb. It was decomposing. Everyone knew it. Lord, if we open it, it's going to be very unpleasant, someone says to him. He says, no, go ahead. The stone is passed aside, and he calls Lazarus, and Lazarus, wrapped in the winding sheets in which he's been buried, just walks out of the tomb. There's stories in uh, autobiography, Yogananda, a story about Yogananda healing, or maybe it was Lahiri Mahashaya who healed someone who had died. And they talked about when they came back, they described the experience. You know, this happens in, in relatively speaking modern times, the story I'm saying. And it was they were off in the astral world and then they heard the voice calling them. And they turned because they heard the voice and then they, the, their consciousness, which had exited their body, came back and re-entered the body at the call of the Master. The same story that Jesus tells. He calls Lazarus. And wherever Lazarus' spirit was, having separated from that body, the voice of his master calls him. So he turns. Follow me. And he comes back for the glory of God. Now, this created quite a sensation because there was, everybody knew that Lazarus was dead. So by the time it comes to be the Passover week, which is what this is, there's a tremendous amount of controversy going through this community. The Pharisees are extremely concerned because they've been able to explain away a lot that Jesus has done, but it's been very difficult for them to explain away that Lazarus was dead and now he's not. In fact, uh, when they finally decide that they have to kill Jesus, somebody suggests that they're really going to have to kill Lazarus too. Because as long as Lazarus is walking around, people are not going to forget what Jesus was able to do. 
So there's this big increasing controversy and threat over Jesus. And so the Passover comes and it's the habit for all the people to come into the city of Jerusalem and to celebrate at the temple there. This is the way the holiday is done in this spiritual community. So people start asking, do you really think that Jesus is going to come? Given that the priests are so against him now and there's such a threat against his life. And it's just all the gossip. And this is what the Bible talks about. Will he come? Have you heard? Do you think he's going to be here? Do you think he'll stand up to them? What do you think is going to happen? Did you hear about Lazarus? I was there. You know, all the conversation like this. So Jesus knows now that his mission on earth is coming to a culmination. And you see, it's all this thrilling, uplifted energy of those who are devoted to him. And there's all this fierce antagonism trying to stop him. And then there's all the anxiety of those who are caught in the middle. You know, I'm a little bit impressed with him, but I'm afraid of the priest. How could the priest be wrong? But oh, I felt something so powerful in his company. And so there's also the, the, the discussion of tactics. You know, how should Jesus do this? So Jesus, first he makes the decision, yes, I'm coming to Jerusalem. And then they all start moving toward the city and the, traveling by, by walking and by other slow means. And just imagine if the convention was going to be held in Marin County, you know, and we all had to start moving toward that place. And we have our little bundles and we're camping by the road and we're beginning to see our distant relatives and all our friends and we're all moving along and we're all going to convene in the big convention center up there. And at a certain point, Jesus, instead of just traveling in the way, the humble way he's been traveling. He suddenly announces, now in this case he says, you know, go to this certain place and find the colt and the mare and bring them to me and I will ride in like this. So for us it would be like, he says, go find me a great big truck and decorate it with roses and I'll ride on the roof of it. And we get about up to the Golden Gate Bridge and we're about to cross. And all of a sudden Jesus simply steps out of the crowd, mounts this animal, and he gathers his disciples, and it says in the Bible, and at a certain point his disciples began at the top of their voices to praise him. And, and he organizes. See, Jesus was not, he, this was not an accident. He says, now is the moment. I am going to come in. I am going to declare myself. I am not going to hold this light in. So he's mounted on this uh, colt, as he uh, describes, on the donkey. And he has his disciples, and they're beginning to praise him. You see now, and all of a sudden, all this powerful energy that has always been in him, that he's been releasing and holding in, releasing and holding in through all this time, all of a sudden he allows it to be completely there. And what happens is, in that moment, Everyone is so magnetized by this, not just his close disciples who are, of course, leading the charge, but everyone who is within any uh, range of feeling that, that force. And so it says in the Bible that everyone began to sing and to praise, and they were stripping the branches off of the trees and laying it down before him. You know, just this excess of devotion. Suddenly, here comes this great messenger of God you know, even the feet of the animal that he's riding upon, it can't touch the bare earth. And then they take off their own cloaks and they lay them down. You know, it, it, it's a very um, extraordinary scene of devotion. In, in Master's autobiography, he talks about his devotion for Master Mahashaya, uh, who was a very great saint, was so great, Yogananda said, that sometimes... After Master Mahashai had walked, Yogananda said, he would fall on the ground and roll in the dust where Master Mahashai had put his foot. It's an extraordinary image, isn't it? Well, here's Jesus coming, and so people are stripping off their own garments and laying them on the ground, you know, so that Jesus, the animal he's riding on, can step on it. Just imagine for a moment what that would feel like. And you see, that's what's happening. All of a sudden, Jesus is not just coming to Jerusalem, but he's coming in in such a way that the whole world is running after him like this. So we get to the Golden Gate Bridge, 
Everybody gets out of their cars. Everybody rushes in from the city. People rush down from those who are already gathered to bring this being of light in. Now those who are threatened by this light and not magnetized it by it, are po- uh, their, their energy, their negativity can become even stronger in that moment. Because they see, they see what's coming toward them. So the Pharisees say to the master, rebuke your disciples. This is not seemly that they should be like this. Be like this. Jesus answered, if I silence them, the very stones would cry out. You see, this is the presence of God coming and nothing can silence it. Now, the other part of that is, all these disciples have been waiting to see what was going to happen. They know that Jesus has declared himself to be a king. You know, as the, our commentary says, this, our disciples little realized what his kingdom really was. And finally, you know, they're going to, the, all the, the people are going to unite behind them and their hope is also they're going to throw off the yoke of the Roman oppressors. All these things are going to happen. I've really backed the right rabbi, all these people are thinking. It's really going to happen now. But the irony of it all is, you see, that when he finally reveals his glory, it's not so that it can be a wonderful, happy ending and all the communities unite and the Pharisees say, oh, we were really wrong and the Romans say, we're so sorry to have really caused you so much problem all these years and everybody just puts their power down and we all just sort of are happily ever after. Not at all. At the moment at which God really reveals that power, then the forces of darkness move even more strongly than ever and within a week, that form is gone. But of course, within three days, it rises again. But isn't it a glorious story? And isn't it just the way it really happens? You know? And what is the lesson of this? Should we hang back and not lay our cloaks in front of Jesus because after all, in a week, he's going to be crucified? Should we not proclaim at the top of our voices the power and the glory of God because the Pharisees in the end are going to crucify him? You know? This is what the challenge of life is. We have to be very, very tender-hearted. We have to allow all the different elements of this world to touch us through and through. And then underneath it, beyond it, around it, through it, at all times, always know this is just a play of God. This is just the waves of the ocean moving on the infinite sea. And no matter how it storms or how it calms, We are the depth of the ocean. We must live in all realities at the same time. What a glorious story this is, the greatest story ever told. Truly it is, isn't it? We live, we rejoice, we suffer, we die, we rise again. And in the midst of it, nothing except the infinite spirit, the great consciousness of God is our true nature. 